Hi everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and this time around we're going to review the new Nikon D850. I've been getting requests for this review since before the camera came out, however, you know how I am. I don't believe that just shooting a couple hundred shots qualifies as a real test. I wanted to really get to know the camera before I rendered a verdict. So. I've been shooting and testing mine for two months or so, knocking out over 16,000 photos in the process. My travels have taken me through 11 states and two countries, so I feel like I've really had a chance to get to know the camera. Also, I know this review is long, but this isn't just about telling you what the camera can do, it's also about showing you how you can use all the cool new features as well. And of course, I share lots of tips, tricks, and advice that I've discovered along the way. Also, while we're going to be going over most of the major features, I do want to mention that this review will cover how I use the camera in the real world, so not every single technical aspect is going to be mentioned. Think of this as more of a real-world field report from a wildlife guy rather than a number-crunching technical review. And by the way, I hope you like nature photography because that's all I do, and the images and examples in this review reflect that. So, let's get started. Controls and Layout First, I have to say I'm loving the layout and ergonomics of this new camera, probably because it's pretty much the same as my D500, so there's virtually no learning curve. The only real notable exceptions between those two cameras are the better placement of the FN1 button on the D850 and a slightly different configuration on the side ports. Now, if you're coming from a D800 or a D810, you will notice quite a few changes. The first is the much deeper and, in my opinion, more comfortable grip on the D850. Of course, the D850 has no built-in flash, so the viewfinder housing looks different and the AF illumination light and flash button are absent as well. However, you do get the nice illuminated buttons now, so in my opinion, I think it's a good trade. Now flipping to the back, you'll notice that the two cameras are more alike than different. Still, the D850 loses the AEAF lock button and instead only has a single AF on button. If you use AEAF lock, you'll need to reassign it on the D852 another button. Although we lose the AEAF lock button, we gain the subselector, aka joystick, as well as the FN2 button, although what you can do with the FN2 button is amazingly limited. Still, overall, I think it's a win. By the way, if you're coming from a non-joystick equipped camera, man, you are in for a real treat. The joystick makes it noticeably easier to move your AF points, and honestly, it's the only way I want to fly. You'll also notice we have a new high resolution touchscreen on the back of the camera, and this is easily the best implementation by Nikon so far. Like the D5 and D500, you can use the screen to flip between photos, you can double tap to zoom into 100% view, and of course you can pinch and zoom. You can also tap to focus or tap to focus and shoot. You can switch between those by pressing the little box on the left hand side when you're in live view. However, unlike the D5 and D500, this camera allows you to use the touchscreen with your menu system as well. Just press to select and flick to scroll. I find it's much easier than moving around with a multi-selector. My only wish for the tilt screen is that it was fully articulated for vertical shots, but you know what, I suppose you can't have everything. Moving on to the top of the camera, you'll see the D850 now features the same layout as the D500 with the movie record, ISO, and exposure comp button right near the shutter release. I personally like this layout far more than the layout we had with the D810 and cameras previous to that. The outgoing D810 used an SD and CF card, but thankfully the CF card slot is history on the D850. Instead, we have an XQD slot and a UHS-2 SD slot, a much better configuration, although I would have preferred twin XQD slots. I know that many people are still leery of XQD cards, but I've been using them since the D4 came out, and I can tell you they are a vast improvement over any current card format. They're much more durable far less prone to problems, and no more bent pins like you would have with CF cards. As for size, it's very close in size to the outgoing D810 and not too much larger than the D500. The D850 is ever so slightly heavier than the D810, but we're only talking 35 grams. In the real world, the weight feels about the same to me. Construction is fantastic and the camera feels solid in the hand. It features a tough magnesium alloy under the skin and has what Nikon calls comprehensive weather and dust sealing. As it turns out, I inadvertently put this to the test when I was out shooting shorebirds along the ocean. I had a particularly large wave sneak up on me while I was checking my exposure and it gave the camera a soaking splash in salt water. I quickly grabbed a water bottle and rinsed the camera. This happened 
nearly two months before this video was published and the camera's still working just fine. Next, I wanted to mention the viewfinder. It's 0.75x magnification, gives the widest view of any Nikon viewfinder to date, and I can assure you that it's a joy to gaze through while you're capturing those 46 megapixel images. You can definitely notice a difference between it and the D810, although it's tougher to tell the difference between the D5 and the D850. Those two are actually very close. Like the D5 and D500, the D850 has the new menu system and allows for more customizations. Like the D5 and D500, I have my PV button set to change my AF area when I press it. If you've never used this feature before, you're really in for a treat. First, let me show you how this works. Let's say I was shooting in group AF for action shots, but occasionally needed to switch to single point AF for more precise focusing on a static subject. Normally, you'd have to mess around with switching back and forth, and you know, you'd probably miss shots as you did so. Not with this feature enabled. Since I have my PV button set to change to a different AF mode when I push and hold, I can be in group AF for my action work, and then when I push and hold the PV button, the camera switches to single point AF for as long as I hold it. If I want to go back to group AF, I simply release the PV button, and the camera switches back. And that's only one of the customizations. There are dozens of options, adding up to hundreds or maybe even thousands of different configurations for your camera. Since setting this up requires you to use a new menu you may not have seen before, especially if you're coming from a DA10, I want to briefly show you how the D850 allows you to customize its controls, since it's a little different than what you might be used to. First, head to the Custom Settings menu, Controls, and select the new Custom Control Assignment menu. From here, you can fully customize your PV, FN, AF on, sub selector, and more. If you'll notice, some options have a left and a right side. When you see that, it means that you can customize the left side for a press and the right side for a press and a dial turn combination. Although most of the time, you can only customize it for a press or a press and a turn. You can't always do both. For our AF mode change example, I simply went to the PV option on the left, I pressed that, and then selected AF area from the next menu. When I press that option, I get to choose which AF area I want when I press. In this case, I chose single point. This is how you customize any of the buttons found under the custom controls menu on the D850. Autofocus. The D850 inherits the Multicam 20K 153 point AF system from the D5 and D500, and it does not disappoint. In the past, I've used my D810 for wildlife from time to time, my hit rate was always better with something like a D5 or D500. So most of the time, the D810 sat on the shelf unless I wanted to do some landscape work. With the D850, all that has changed. The new AF system is one of the biggest upgrades to come to the D800 series, and my results are finally on par with what I see with the D5 and the D500. In my field tests, I primarily use D9 and Group AF for action, and I switch to single point for more static subjects. Overall, I'm very happy with the results. Compared to the DA10, this is an incredible upgrade. I'm using this camera in situations where I would normally go ahead and keep that DA10 in the bag. From an AF standpoint, it just does everything better than the D810. It locks on better, it tracks better, and it delivers more consistent results in an action scenario. In fact, when things do go wrong, it's usually the operator that's at fault, not the camera. As I mentioned, the new layout has 153 points instead of the 51 AF points we had with the D810. The new AF area coverage is about 30% wider than the D810, and it really does make a difference in the field. As with the D5 and D500, only 55 AF points are user selectable. The rest are in between those points and used with the various AF tracking modes. In practice, this works great. It allows you to quickly move your AF area around and still be able to place your point where you like it in the composition. Speaking of which, the points are smaller, so the dynamic area AF numbers have changed from what we had with the DA10, but they represent about the same coverage in the viewfinder. Where we had D9 on the 810, we now have D25. Where we had D21, we now have D72. And where we had D51, we now have D153. In addition, there is a smaller area on the D850 called D9, and it takes up a much smaller area in the AF field than the D9 we had previously on the D810. <laughs> Hope all that makes sense. Personally, if I'm using one of the dynamic modes, it's usually D9, sometimes D25. 
There's also been some changes to the focus tracking with lock-on options from what we had in the D810. Like the D5 and 500, we now have five settings from quick to delayed. In most situations, a setting of three seems to be about right. If you feel like the AF is letting go too easily, move up to four or five. If you feel it's too sticky when you want to change targets, try one or two. The second part of the menu is for subject motion, and you can select erratic, steady, or in between. I usually have mine set in the middle. Note that this tends to be more for motion coming towards the camera than lateral motion, so if you have a subject coming at the camera that's prone to sudden stops, selecting erratic may help improve the keeper rate. For something like cyclists coming towards you, steady is the better choice. For my wildlife work, I tend to leave it in the middle most of the time. Now those are the basics, but for a much more detailed explanation about how to get the most from this setting and really apply it in the field, make sure you check out my Nikon AF book. The D850 also includes Nikon's Auto AF Fine Tune System, and it can be a really handy way to calibrate your lens to your camera. Now there is a trick to getting the best results from this feature, and I did a video all about it not too long ago. I'll put a link in the description area on YouTube and on the uh, card above. Finally, the D850 inherits the 180K RGB pixel meter from the D5 and D500. This not only improves the performance of the matrix metering system, but for autofocus, it's also linked to 3D AF and auto AF areas. So both of which are now significantly better than what we saw with the D810 and honestly other cameras that had the 51 point AF system. D5 versus D850. Now, as I mentioned, the D850 and D5 share the same multi-cam 20K AF system. However, there has been some controversy as to whether the D850's AF system can really measure up to that of the D5. Between my field time with the camera and hours of tedious experimentation, all I can say for sure is that testing autofocus is about as fun as getting a root canal. The thing is, testing AF is always a challenge and there's no real good way to test two AF systems that are really close in performance like this. The reality is, there are just too many variables at play. So with that in mind, here are some of my thoughts. First, I did some field work. I actually had been shooting action for several days with a D850 before the first reports of AF inadequacy came out. Now, when I heard them, that struck me as odd because I was totally satisfied with my results for action. My keeper rate seemed about the same as what I would have had with the D5. However, then I ran into a situation with some turns. When the camera was focused more towards the background, I noticed it had a difficult time picking up the grossly out of focus turn in the viewfinder. This is actually a pretty common occurrence with any camera, so I didn't think much of it at the time. Instead, I just set the focus memory of my 600mm lens to the approximate distance of the turns, and when my AF went to the background, I just pressed the memory recall button and brought it back to where the turns were. This made the turns much more distinct in the viewfinder, and the camera instantly grabbed focus. Using this method, I had absolutely no shortage of tack sharp turn in flight shots to pick from when I was done shooting. Anyhow, I decided to try it with the D5 to see if it fared any better, and it did seem to latch onto the turns better than the D850 in that situation. However, the important thing here is that both cameras still sucked at getting an AF lock when the turn was close and the focus was off in the distance. It's just that the D5 sucked a little bit less. Either way, in a non-testing situation, I would still use the memory focus option regardless of which body was attached to my lens. I also tested this scenario in my garage by hanging a black socket against a dark but contrasty background, a little more controlled test than a moving turn. I'd manually focus the lens to infinity and then try to focus on the socket. About 50 to 60% of the time, the D5 would get the idea. The D850 was more like 20 or 30% on this particular test. So under the very specific circumstance of a low contrast target that's very blurred out in the foreground with a contrasty background and the lens focused towards that background, the D5 sucks a little less at acquiring the target than the D850. Beyond that, I didn't notice any other performance differences in the field for the way I shoot. 3D AF is the other area where some people seem to see a difference in performance. However, honestly, that's not a mode I like to use for wildlife photography. 3D AF tends to be too unpredictable, especially for animals that are about the same color as a background. Plus, it doesn't like to stay on the eye as well as I'd like for my critters. However, I did want to check it and see, so I did a couple of different tests here at home. 
The first is my cat litter container pendulum test. In this test, we raise and release a weighted container and try to track it with 3D AF. I like this test because it's more or less consistent from swing to swing, allowing me to give both cameras an equal chance at the same target. As it turns out, my results were about the same. In some cases, the D5 did better, in others, the D850 actually did. I chewed about 30 frames for each camera, and as long as I achieved a good initial lock, both cameras would get 25 or 28 of the target sharp. Pretty good. We also did a bicycle test with my wife swerving back and forth between cones, and the results were, again, about the same. Most of the photos were acceptably sharp from both cameras. In some cases, the D5 was a little better, but once the D850 edged it out. So my conclusion is inconclusive on this. In my tests and field work, I'm just not seeing much of a difference between the D5 and the D850. I'm very happy with my keeper rate in the field, even with tough subjects like these sanderlings at close range zipping by. That said, keep in mind I use group AF, dynamic, and single point, very seldom 3D. All I can say for sure is that with proper technique and usage, this AF system is giving me a very acceptable keeper rate that really does seem on par with my D5. I'd certainly not hesitate to use this camera due to any perceived deficiencies in the AF system, and it's certainly superior to any of Nikon's 51-point AF systems, including the one found on the D4 and D4S, and the D4 and I have captured quite a bit of action. Sharpness Concerns Speaking of autofocus, I also want to mention a few tips for getting sharper images with this camera. I've seen more than a few posts from various message boards where people don't feel like they are really getting the sharpness they expect when looking closely at their images, like at 100% zoom. In the vast majority of cases, these sharpness errors look an awful lot like motion blur to me, either from subject motion or from the shooter. The thing is, the D850 is more capable than any other full-frame Nikon camera at revealing any flaws in your technique. The truth is, to get the most from this sensor, you need to feed it the best glass, followed by great camera support and ample shutter speed to keep subject motion in check. If you miss any of the above, you'll likely not get the most from the sensor. First, let's start with glass. Here's a list of the lenses Nikon recommends for the D850. Note that other older glass can work well, as do many third-party lenses, but Nikon obviously favors their new optics. You may want to pause now if you want a longer look at this list, and I'll post this list on my site as well. Next, we need good support. It's not that you can't handhold this camera. I certainly do when absolutely necessary, but I still try to use support with it whenever I can. I recommend using good quality tripods or monopods. Avoid the cheap stuff. It's often no better than handholding. Finally, shutter speed. Whenever I shoot high-res cameras, I always allow for up to a stop more shutter speed when shooting action than I normally would use with a lower-res camera. For instance, with my D4, I'd often shoot birds in flight between 1 1600th and 1 2000th. With this camera, I prefer 1 3200th or 1 4000th of a second for the best results. If the birds are faster, I'll bump that up even higher. Many times, people get caught in the whole, that should be enough shutter speed trap when they're looking at their pictures, but don't let that happen to you. If you see motion blur, bump up that shutter speed. Finally, keep in mind that these suggestions are for getting the most from the sensor. The truth is, if you are seeing a flaw in your technique, it was always there. Your old camera just didn't have the resolution to show it to you. Here's an example of how that works. Okay, let me demonstrate how this flaw in your technique type of thing can look in the real world. This is an image that I took with my D850, but I downsampled it to D4 size. It's 33% zoomed in right now, and you can see it's a little bit crooked. I'd have to fix it if I was going to use it, but let's go ahead and zoom in. Here we are at 50%. Looks pretty good. 66% looks good, and 100% actually looks pretty good. We can see decent feather detail, and we see lots of uh, information here. I think it looks like a good shot. If I had shot this with my D4, I would have been happy with it, especially if I just went ahead and added a little unsharp mass to it. You can see it really brings out some detail here. However, this isn't telling the whole story. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the original D850 file looked like. Go back to the face. And you can see it's actually soft. And that's the thing I'm trying to point out here, is that the D850 is going to show flaws that other cameras just were not capable of showing. So you do have to accept that, and you do have to sort of up your game to get the most out of it. 
Of course, I can't resist a shameless plug for my Nikon AF book at this juncture. It not only covers AF, but also everything you need to know about getting tack sharp images. I'll put a link in the description area of YouTube if you want to go ahead and check it out, and I'll put a card in as well. You can click that up there in the corner. Now, the D850 didn't just upgrade the phase detection AF system in the viewfinder, it also added a couple of really cool new features to Live View. The first is called Pinpoint AF Mode, and it's far more useful than you may think. This mode allows you to use an AF area in Live View that's only 25% the size of the normal AF area. To switch to it, flip on Live View and press the Focus Mode button as you turn the subcommand dial on the front of the camera. When you see Pin at the top of the LCD, you're there. At first, I wasn't so sure this mode was really necessary, but within the first couple of days of using the camera, I was already in love with it. We were in the Smoky Mountains early one morning, and there was an elk sitting in a foggy field, so I decided to put the camera down to ground level and use the tilt screen to grab some shots. When I zoomed in using the normal live view AF area mode, it covered too much of his face. I wanted it to focus just on the eye. Remembering this new mode, I quickly switched and have been sold on it ever since. Sure, it's not useful for every single situation, but when you need focus at a very precise point in the image, you'll definitely want to give it a try. Next, we have focus peaking, and it's another feature I really like, maybe even better than Pinpoint AF. To use it, you'll first have to turn it on, so switch on Live View and press the I button on the back of the camera. Scroll towards the bottom and you'll see an option that says peak, probably with the word off next to it. Press that and select level 1, 2, or 3. The higher the number, the larger the peaking area. I usually leave it on too most of the time, that seems like a good middle ground. However, if you feel like you want more precision, or that it's too tough to tell what's in really critical focus, choose one instead. If a larger zone makes it easier for you, pick three. Also note that zooming in can help. Now that you have it turned on, just pop into Live View, flip the camera to Manual Focus, and, well, go ahead and manually focus. When the subject is in focus, it will be painted with a peaking color, in this case red. You can actually set that color in your custom settings menu under D8 if you don't like red. Get as much of the color on your selected focus area as possible, and you're all set. Perfect focus. I think this will be a phenomenal tool for anyone using manual focus with Live View. Now, whether that's macros, wildlife, landscape, or even using legacy or manual focus glass, this is an incredible addition. It's super easy to use and a feature that I've already started to use in the field. Coupled with the tilt screen, it makes super low wildlife shots so much easier than any other method. Focus stacking. The D850 also has a focus stacking feature that Nikon, unfortunately, calls focus shift shooting. In case you've never tried focus stacking before, this is basically where you take a series of images at different focus distances for a particular scene, overlapping the sharp areas a bit as you do so. You then take these images and stack them together using third-party software like Helicon Focus, Zarine Stacker, or even Photoshop. The software looks at the photos and creates an output image using only the sharpest areas of the images you provided. The idea is that the final output image will have maximum sharpness from front to back. Now, focus stacking is used instead of tiny f-stops in order to avoid image softening diffraction. For macro shooters, it additionally allows for getting an entire image sharp since sometimes even stopping all the way down won't cover an exceedingly close subject. In the past, stacking was a tedious process we did manually, carefully taking one image after the other, painstakingly moving our focus point through the image as we went from shot to shot. Often, your subject would move or the light would change when we were trying to go ahead and stack a large number of images, forcing you to start over again. After using the system on the D850, I'm happy to say those days are officially over. This is fast, easy, and once you try it, you'll never go back to manual stacking. Let's do a quick overview just to get you started. To access the Focus Shift Shooting option, head to the Photo Shooting menu and all the way down to Focus Shift Photography. When you click that item, you'll see the options shown here. Hitting Start will initiate the process, but you'll probably want to make a few changes first. First thing is you'll want to set the number of photos you want in your stack. The way the system works is that it will shoot up to the number you select or 
stop when the lens reaches infinity, whichever comes first. As a side note, the camera doesn't stop at the actual infinity mark, but at the end of the focus range. So you may end up with a couple of out of focus images at the back of your stack that were taken beyond infinity. Just delete those. As for setting the number of photos, it really depends on what you're photographing. For landscapes with a lens under 50 millimeter, a moderate f-stop, and a foreground a couple of feet away, I usually won't need more than a dozen shots, sometimes as little as three if I'm using a really wide lens. So my strategy for landscapes with this system is to set a really high number, like 100 or so, and then set my foreground focus and just let her rip, allowing the camera to just shoot until it hits the end of the focus range. In this scenario, you'll never hit the number of selected shots, but it allows you to sort of just set it and forget it, so I like it that way. For close-ups or macros, and the exceedingly shallow depth of field that goes along with those type of photos, you may want to set a real number here. Note that if you set too many, you can always just delete the extra ones that went too far. Conversely, if you look at the last image captured and found the sequence stopped too soon, just start another sequence, leaving the focus where it is. That part's very important because the camera will pick up right where it left off. The next area that throws people is the focus step width setting. In fact, the internet really seems to overthink this one. In my testing, I've determined that this should actually have been called the sharpness overlap setting because that's what it seems to control. The system is smart. It knows the focal length, the f-stop, and the distance, so it has all the info necessary to figure out how far to move the focus between shots and provide adequate overlap in the sharp areas for focus stacking. This setting allows you to tweak that amount of overlap. I find that a setting of four seems to work really well for everything I do, from macro to landscape, regardless of the focal length, f-stop, or distance to the subject. However, if you feel like you are getting too much overlap, set a higher number. If you feel like there isn't enough overlap, go ahead and set a smaller value. You can also set an interval between shots to reduce vibration caused by the shutter and lens focusing. You can turn on exposure smoothing if you're using an auto exposure mode, and you can turn on silent photography to keep things quiet. A side benefit of silent photography is that it eliminates all camera vibration. The only vibration that would enter into the process is from your lens focusing, and in my opinion, that is virtually non-existent. When I use silent photography mode, I often don't set in any delay between shots, allowing the camera to knock out the stack in a very short amount of time. Finally, you can also tell the camera to put your stack into a new folder. But a side note to that too, when you do that, your regular images will then be dumped into that folder unless you switch back to the one you started with. But it's still sort of handy. At any rate, to use it, mount your camera to a tripod and focus on the nearest area of the frame that you want sharp. This is often outside the AF area, so I usually switch to live view for this part. Once you have it, adjust the settings as I described a moment ago, and go ahead and press start. After a moment, the camera will run the series, and you'll be all set. It'll take you less time to do it than it took for me to explain it. Also, for more info and tricks on using this technique, as well as a tutorial on how to put together all your completed stack images, be sure to check out my Nikon AF book. Shutter, frames per second, and buffer. The D850 gets a newly designed shutter to help improve vibration dampening as much as possible during shooting. This shutter is capable of knocking out seven frames per second, or with the optional grip and a battery from the D5, you can go nine frames per second fast for any camera and really impressive for a camera of this resolution. Now before we get too far, let's talk about what it takes to go 9 frames per second and how much it's going to cost you. In order to knock out those kinds of numbers, you're going to need the grip at $397. You'll also need the higher power D5 battery at $150. Now you're going to probably want to charge that battery too, so add in another $370 for the charger. Oh, and finally, you need a special cover for the grip, the BL5, so you can use the battery. This comes up to a grand total of $942. And that's not all the bad news either. In my opinion, the D850 grip isn't quite as nice as the one we had with the D810 or like even the D500. Now don't get me wrong, it's very close, but it does have just a touch more play in it when attached. And I'm not a fan of the tiny attachment wheel either. I really liked the large one on the D810 grip much better. 
So the big question is, is it worth it? Well, yes and no. If you shoot a lot of action, yes, the grip is worth it. However, for most of this review, I did not have the battery grip. And although I miss the D5 and D500's high frame rate sometimes, I was surprisingly happy with the number of keepers I captured at 7 frames per second. So if you only do action on a casual basis, I'd say try the camera without the grip first or maybe just the grip and the regular batteries and kind of see how it goes. On the other hand, if you love action, then go for the grip because although I got by on 7 frames per second, it was really hard not to break out the D5 a few times. Now for the buffer. Nikon has listed the buffer as capable of going 51 shots before things slow down, and many reviewers, including myself, have found this simply isn't the case in the real world. The thing is, there's a lot that goes into buffer capacity. First, you need to be writing only to the XQD card. That's a must. I normally use the 400 megabyte per second Sony cards, but I also tested with the Lexar 440 megabyte per second cards. Funny thing is, most of the time the numbers were within a frame or two of each other, and it was sometimes a Lexar one, sometimes a Sony did, so figure it out, right? Next, you need to have the camera set to lossless compressed raw. Next, you'll need to be at lower ISOs to get the best results. The higher the ISO, the fewer shots you can get before the buffer starts to chug. Finally, the buffer capacity is highly dependent on the amount of detail in the scene. In fact, the only way I could get to 51 shots with the T850 was to put the lens cap on the camera and shoot totally black shots. For normal scenes with an average amount of detail, the capacity was much lower due to the larger file sizes you get when you photograph things that aren't the inside of lens caps. In the real world, shooting 14-bit RAW at 7 frames per second, I typically get about 35 shots at lower ISOs. Again, this is scene dependent and it can vary slightly, but that's my average. For 14-bit at 9 frames per second, this drops down to the low 20s, allowing only about a 2.5 second burst before the camera starts to slow and chug. Now, although this is good for most action, I can promise that you'll end up hitting that buffer on a very regular basis during prolonged sequences. One interesting note is that in DX mode, shooting 14-bit RAW files, I'm only getting about 45 images or so, a far cry from the 200 I get with the D500. Now, this makes me think that the D500 has more memory set aside for the buffer than the D850 does, and you know what? That's kind of a shame. Now, there are a few things you can do to increase the buffer capacity. First, you can switch to 12-bit. If you're shooting above ISO 400, 14-bit isn't really giving you much additional leeway for post-processing anyway. The second trick is to switch to one of the crop modes if you know that you'll be cropping back home on the computer. Of course, you can also do both. For example, if you switch to 12-bit and 1.2x crop mode, you can knock out around 70 photos at 9 frames per second before you see the end of the buffer. You can get to 200 shots if you're only at 7 frames per second. So it's not an impossible situation. You just might need to make some adjustments when buffer size is critical. Be sure to stop by my site and check out the blog post for this video. I have a complete chart with all my buffer findings posted over there. Now it's not all doom and gloom for the buffer, however. One positive note is that although the buffer may fill faster than we like, it also empties within three to four seconds in my tests, at least when using a fast XQD card. So it's not like the old days where you hit the buffer and it took an eternity to empty. Still, here's hoping that when the D860 comes out, it has a bit more capacity in there. Sensor performance. The 45.7 megapixel Nikon design sensor in this camera is brand new and in my tests was an excellent overall performer. The new sensor lacks an anti-aliasing filter and the amount of detail it captures is staggering. This sensor is up nearly 10 megapixel from the DA10, so in practical terms this means you can now knock out a 34 inch print instead of a 30 inch print at 240 ppi. Of course it also allows for more flexibility in cropping when the need arises. This new sensor is the first Nikon sensor to use backside illumination, meaning that all the circuitry is on the back of the sensor, allowing for more efficient capturing of all those little photons. However, Nikon says the big reason for the switch is for faster readout, allowing us to do things like shoot at 9 frames per second. First, let's look at ISO, since that's the one that seems to get the most questions. This camera, like the DA10, has a base ISO of 64, and I'm glad to see that it was carried over. ISO 64 is only two-thirds of a stop from ISO 100, but I found it invaluable when shooting longer exposures for landscape work, and I know that the portrait photographers out there like it for bright days with those fast 1.4 lenses. 
On the flip side, the camera's maximum ISO heads all the way up to 25,600, a full stop higher than the D810. So let's take a look at how the D850 compares to the D810, D5, and D500. In each case, I downsampled the higher resolution image to match the size of the lower resolution camera. This gives us a good way to compare how the final output from the two cameras will compare in print or on screen. We'll start at ISO 1600 since the lower ISOs are just fantastic from any of these cameras. So let's start with the D810. Nikon claims the D850 is a full stop better than the D810, but you know what, looking at the RAW files from both cameras, I'm just not seeing it. In fact, I'm hard pressed to see any real difference in noise performance between the two bodies. Sure doesn't look like a full stop to me. Don't get me wrong, I think Nikon should be commended for bumping the resolution and not slipping backwards in ISO performance, but to my eyes, the noise levels look pretty darn close. Certainly not a stop apart. Next, let's do the same exercise with the D5. At 1600, it's actually pretty close, although you can see the D5 holding a slight edge. As we go up the ISO scale, however, the D5 starts to pull ahead. In fact, as we get to ISO 6400 and 12800, you can really start to see the D5 come into its own and really pull ahead. Looking back and forth at these higher ISO images, I'd say at 6400 and higher, the D5 has somewhere between two thirds and a full stop advantage over the D850. I've also had a lot of people ask about the D850 in DX mode versus the D500, so I ran some tests on that. Note that in these tests, I had to downsample the D500 image to match the smaller DX image area from the D850. At ISO 1600, both are looking close. However, as we get into higher ISO numbers, it almost seems like the D500 may have an ever so slight advantage over the D850, at least if you look really hard. Now this may be only a quarter stop or so if there is a difference, but you know, in the real world, it's gonna be a wash. Finally, I wanted to run a test with the D850 in full frame mode versus the D500. The reason for this is to demonstrate that there is an advantage to using the full sensor area versus cropping. As you can see, at ISO 6400, a downsampled full frame D850 image easily beats a D500 shot. So the moral of the story here is that in low light, try to use the full sensor when you can and avoid cropping if possible. So in the end, it's a good performer, but don't expect miracles. One side note, however, I have noticed that the D850 files take to noise reduction really well. So even though I normally wouldn't want to shoot a sensor with this performance too much above ISO 3200, I don't hesitate to use this one at ISO 6400 and sick Topaz denoise on the files. In a pinch, I might even bump it to 12,800, but now it'd have to be a pretty tight pinch. Also, one more consideration. Remember a few moments ago when we talked about needing more shutter speed for critical sharpness? Well, you may find yourself bumping ISO to higher levels than you normally would in order to maintain critical sharpness when shooting action or when hand holding the camera. In fact, I found myself actually avoiding my 200 to 500 a little bit on this camera in favor of faster glass, especially in action scenarios or hand holding scenarios for that very reason. Next, let's take a look at dynamic range. The D850 is a very good overall performer, but it really isn't the best at anything. When it comes to low ISO dynamic range, the D750 still holds the lead, although the D850 is no slouch and is still neck and neck with the D810, despite the extra resolution. Now, when we get to higher ISO dynamic range, it's very good, but the D5 is still king. Now, looking at that chart, you might think it's kind of a jack of all trades and master of none, but the differences here are subtle. It's very close to Nikon's best performing cameras at both low and high ISO, and it gives very good overall performance. Also, after shooting this camera for the last two months, I can assure you that any deficiencies you see here on paper only make the rarest of appearances in the real world, so don't sweat it too much. It would only be in the most extreme cases where you might want one of the slightly better performing cameras. For me, the D850 has really tackled everything I've thrown at it from a dynamic range standpoint. Finally, I just have to talk about the files because I love what I'm seeing from this camera. Even at high ISO, the D850 tends to hold its colors well and the color accuracy is just outstanding. The files themselves are a joy to post process and it seems like I need to do far less work to get the look I'm after in Lightroom and Photoshop. In short, they kind of pop out of the camera looking great and I couldn't be happier. In fact, these files are one of the main reasons I would grab this over one of my other Nikons. Miscellaneous specs and performance. The first thing I want to talk about in this section is called silent live view photography and it's way cooler than you think. 
This mode uses a fully electronic shutter to capture the images, so not only is it 100% silent, it's also 100% vibration free, the ultimate two for one. First, the silent part is fantastic if you're in a situation where silence is golden. For me, I think of sensitive wildlife subjects, but I think wedding and event photographers can probably appreciate this one as well. However, the biggest perk for me with this mode is that it's completely vibration free, very handy when shooting slowish shutter speeds for macro and landscape work. If you use this in conjunction with exposure delay mode, you may be able to skip the cable release from now on. Pretty cool, or at least pretty handy for those of us who occasionally leave our cable release at the last waterfall we shot. <laughs> Another really cool feature is that if you have your camera set to continuous high, you can shoot in this mode at six frames per second. I took advantage of this when I was out shooting waves as they crashed into the pier at Grand Haven Lighthouse. Timing waves perfectly is always a trick, so when I saw some good ones about to smash into the pier, I just lay on the shutter release for a second or two and let her rip, giving me a huge selection of waves so I could pick just the right shot. One word of caution, however, if you have stuff moving rapidly through the frame, rolling shutter can be a potential problem, kind of making your images look like you shot them through a bowl of jello. To activate this mode, press the I button while in live view and head to the SL option. Now press that button and select mode 1. Since you're wondering, mode 2 is for shooting 30 JPEGs per second in DX mode should you ever need to do that sort of thing. However, most of us will want to use the entire imaging area and are probably shooting raw anyhow, so stick with mode 1. Next we have battery life. The D850 gets the new EN EL15A battery and is rated for 1,840 shots from the D810's 1,200 or so. The new camera also features natural light white balance, and I have to admit, I often prefer it for my outdoor shots to auto white balance. Although, since I shoot raw, it really doesn't make much of a difference either way. However, JPEG shooters might want to give it a test drive. Now, I usually don't mention video in these reviews since I seldom use my DSLRs for that purpose, but I did want to mention that the D850 can do 4K video using the entire imaging area, which is incredibly cool. In addition, it now has flat picture control for easier post-processing, it has some slow motion modes, and more. Heck, you can even do 8K time lapses with it. Recommendations. So, should you get a D850? Well, as always, it depends. Let's do a few quick comparisons and I'll give you my thoughts. D850 versus D810. The truth is, there's no contest here. Unless you have some desperate need for a build-in flash, the D850 is the D810 superior in every way. Now, don't get me wrong, the D810 is still a wonderful camera, but the D850 just brings so much more to the table with greater resolution and the same or better performance across the board. In my mind, the only reason to get a D810 over the D850 comes down to price. If you can't swing the D850, a D810 can still deliver great images at a more affordable price. However, if you can afford the D850, it's a no-brainer between these two. D850 versus D500. Now here's an interesting one. The D850's DX crop area is 19.4 megapixel, pretty darn close to the D500's 20.9 megapixel sensor. As such, I've had a lot of emails asking if maybe the D850 could double as a D500 replacement, giving the best of both full frame and DX, and honestly, that's a solid thought. However, there are still a few considerations. First, the D500 is 10 frames a second and the D850 is only 9. And you have to buy a grip and all the required accessories to make that happen. Buffer-wise, at 7 frames per second and in DX mode, the D850 can match the D500. However, at 9 frames per second in 14-bit mode, it can only hold 46 images or so before the buffer fills. So the D500 does have an advantage here, although I personally usually don't shoot 46 images straight anyway, much less 200. Now in my mind, a grip D850 will get you just about any shot in a normal action scenario that you could capture with a D500. In fact, I'm retiring my D500 in favor of the Grip D850. I think the Grip D850 comes close enough in performance to the D500 that it simply isn't going to make much difference, if any, for my photography. Of course, the D850 is a lot more expensive than the D500, especially if you go for the Grip. So don't buy the D850 just to crop it to DX size all the time. If you can normally fill the frame in FX mode, then the D850 makes a lot of sense. However, if you think you'll be cropping to DX most of the time, save your money, get a D500, and grab some nice glass to go with it. D850 versus D5. 
When the D850 was announced, many thought it was the end of the D5. After all, who needs a D5 when the D850 is so super cool, right? Well, I do for one. Here's the thing, although I think the D850 will be my primary camera for just about everything I shoot, there are times the D5 will still get the call. The D5 has a significantly higher frame rate, even against a gripped D850. It has a shorter mirror blackout, a virtually bottomless buffer, better high ISO performance, better high ISO dynamic range, better build quality, and in my opinion at least, better ergonomics. The truth is, when the going gets tough, the D5 just gets the shot and has for me over and over. In fact, if a time traveling photographer stopped by and told me that in five minutes I was going to have the opportunity to capture a once in a lifetime action shot, I would immediately strap the D5 to my lens, no hesitation. The D5 wins every time when you're in extreme action situations. That said, I take the D850 over the D5 all day long for most of my wildlife work, as well as landscape and macro shots. The D850 will end up being my primary camera without a doubt. However, if you are an extreme action shooter, then I'd hesitate to cross the D5 off your list. It's not good at everything, not even close, but when it comes to extreme action, low light, and just sheer performance, it's still the king. Of course, there's more to getting great photos than just the cameras. You have to have the right know-how as well. And that's where my ebooks, Secrets to the Nikon Autofocus System and Secrets to Stunning Wildlife Photography come in. Both are filled with hundreds and hundreds of pages just jam-packed with practical tips, tricks, and advice for getting the most from your camera and your photography. In fact, if you think this video had a lot of info, just wait till you crack open one of those books. Check them out at my site. I'll put a link in the description area on YouTube and on the card above. Also, be sure to stop by my site and sign up for my free email newsletter. And I'd love it if you'd subscribe to my YouTube channel. As always, thanks so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, please tell your friends. Thanks again. Have a great day.